Hello and welcome to this session on descriptive studies, ecological studies and cross-sectional studies. In this session we're going to explore the basic design aspects of descriptive, ecological and cross-sectional studies. We're going to look at and understand when to use these study designs we're also going to analyze the strengths and limitations of the designs of these studies, descriptive, ecological and cross-sectional. Just a reminder, the yellow slides are slides that are useful for the assignment. Pale yellow slides are slides that are useful analysis slides that will deepen your understanding of epidemiology. In this session we're going to look at descriptive studies, ecological studies and cross-sectional studies. It's worthwhile noting that cross-sectional studies can be descriptive and they can be analytic and by analytic we mean they compare both exposures and outcomes and try to find a relationship a link between exposure and the outcome in descriptive studies we generally only look at either the exposure or the outcome uh, and we don't uh, try and connect the two together to find if there is a relationship between them so let's start with descriptive studies. Descriptive studies are used to observe and describe the natural history of a disease or a health problem, the where and the when. This also could be a positive aspect such as uh, mental health and well-being or a positive aspect of uh, physical health. It can also look at a range of health issues facing a community, at both at a local community level, at a country level or a global health level, usually in the form of a health profile and we'll look at some examples a bit later. It can also be used to look at who is affected, how many people are affected and how they experience uh, a disease or health problem or uh, as well a positive health state. So in a nutshell descriptive studies are about who is affected, what ha is happening to them, when has it happened to them and where has it happened to them. Descriptive studies are most often used to investigate outcomes. They often look at the way the outcomes affect people of different ages of different sexes, uh, in different geographical areas and over different time periods. Less often they look at exposures, but they can do. Exposures such as uh, consumption of alcohol, and there's an example of that, and changes in consumption of uh, alcohol. These studies generally make use of routinely collected data, census data, health surveillance data or cancer registry data. Here's an example of descriptive study and it's an Ebola situation report uh, from a few years ago and you can see here a range of countries listed and the number of Ebola cases they have, both Ebola deaths and people uh, affected by Ebola. And you can see there that Sierra Leone, Liberia and Guinea are affected badly and places like Italy, Mali, Nigeria are affected uh, to a, only a very small extent. This is another example of a descriptive study or a country profile. And this is one from, again, from WHO, 
and it shows a range of indicators such as life expectancy, uh, adult mortality rates between 15 and 60 years per thousand population, uh, the maternal mortality ratio, incidence of malaria per 100,000 population, the prevalence uh, or level of uh, tuberculosis in, in a country, and it also shows the top 10 causes of death in children under five, such as malaria, acute respiratory infections, prematurity, birth asphyxia. So community profiles can be at the country level and can explore and describe a range of health issues in a country. Another more recent example of a descriptive study is uh, this is uh, the UK uh, statistics and daily updates on COVID and the number of COVID tests that have been processed, number of patients admitted to hospital, number of uh, people who have tested positive for COVID and the number of deaths within 28 days of a positive test. So this is a kind of health surveillance, health monitoring. Lastly, this is again a descriptive community health profile this time at a district level and developed by Public Health England and again you can see similar things here where you have number of children in poverty, number of obese adults, smoking prevalence, alcohol per specific hospital stays, uh, breastfeeding initiation, a number of cases of sexually transmitted infections, hip fractures in people aged 65 and over, and suicide rates and uh, mortality rates from cardiovascular disease and cancer. Now this is an example of a descriptive study and it's a study of Russia between 1970 and 1998 and the interesting thing to look at is what happens uh, post 1991 and 1991 was a really interesting year because it was the year that uh, the Soviet Union broke up and Russia became the Russian Federation and separated out from all the other parts of the Soviet Union and it was also the year that Boris Yeltsin came to power for and for the next 10 years there was a high level of democracy compared to pre-1991 and you can see here that over the first uh, four years of that de decade of the 1990s life expectancy actually went down for both women and men it went down a slightly lower rate for women compared to men but both women and men experienced quite a significant reduction in their life expectancy at birth and this paper explores the reasons why that happened and their conclusions based on this descriptive study that they did was that it was due to an increase in the use of alcohol during that time and this uh, at this descriptive level we don't know whether that is the true cause of what happened and the uh, decline in life expectancy because alcohol uh, consumption is not going to affect people short term so there may be a longer term effect uh, so it's unclear and we need to investigate a bit more when that alcohol uh, consumption started it could be that it started post 1991 or thereabouts uh, or it could be that that alcohol change in alcohol consumption happened earlier um, but it, it, it does fit, if we look at it, that the, with the change in government, with the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, there was high levels of uncertainty, there was a lot of uh, shortages in the shops, so there is a potential and a lot of frustration with people, so there is a potential that people did start drinking more, both women and men, and that the stress and the uncertainty created an impact on their mental health and well-being, which then affected their physical health and well-being, and in turn led to a decline in life expectancy. So this is a paper worth having a look at to explore this in more detail and to understand what a descriptive study is, and the details of the paper are given on this slide. So what are the strengths of the descriptive study design? Well, it's cheap and quick because it often uses routine statistics which are often readily available and often free. They're useful for generating hypotheses that we can then test at the individual level by using one of the other 
uh, study designs such as a cohort study or a case control study. They're useful for monitoring and surveillance, and you could see that with the examples I gave earlier about uh, the Ebola update and the COVID daily update. The big limitation of descriptive study designs is that they do not tell us what could have caused the health problems or diseases that we are describing. Even if they do look at exposures, they cannot really connect the two together. They cannot con connect the exposure, the possible cause, to the effect, the disease that is being described. Just a note, um, often in uh, journal articles they don't say that they are a descriptive study and when they do do so, some of them also have an analytical component, i.e. they do look at both exposure and outcome and try and make a judgement about the relationship between the two, even though most of the paper, most of the research done that they are discussing is largely descriptive so just be aware of that that uh, sometimes descriptive studies are not just descriptive they can have an analytical component now let's move on to ecological studies so ecological studies examine both exposures and health outcomes they look at things from a population level and so they therefore look at average exposures and link them, relate them to average health outcomes in a population. They usually categorise uh, this relationship or the average exposures and average health outcomes where possible by age, sex, ethnicity, socioeconomic status but not always. There are two types of ecological studies geographical ecological studies and temporal ecological studies. Geographical ecological studies compare a number of geographical areas, cities or countries often, and see what the differences are between them. So essentially they're looking at populations in specific geographical areas. Temporal ecological studies compare the same population over time for example, the population of London every day or month over a year and link that, for example, to air pollution and uh, three-day mortality rates. So in this context, it's only one population, but it's studied a number of different points in time. So what are the key uses of ecological studies? Well, they can investigate differences in health between different populations in different areas and they try and work out why there are differences. Occasionally ecological studies can simply be descriptive and they just look at exposures or outcomes but generally most of the time they try and connect both exposures and outcomes and try and find some kind of relationship at the population level. They can also investigate clustering of a disease where a disease is affecting a specific group of people in a specific area and the exposure is not known. This often happens when there is a spatially defined exposure and the most common ones are, are industrial in nature, such as an industrial facility emitting chemical pollution or a chemical spill into a lake or some other kind of man-made event. They can also investigate community level health interventions and an example of that would be a policy such as a smoking ban in public places and you could do that across two geographical areas or over time so for example you could look at two cities one with a smoking ban one without and then see the differences in respiratory illness and deaths or you could do it in one city over time, both before and after the smoking ban. So again, you'd be looking at average exposures, you know, average levels of smoking, average levels of air pollution, and then average levels of mortality. You would not be connecting uh, the exposure, the air pollution or the smoking to the individual, 
and you would not be connecting the health outcome, the disease, the, the deaths from respiratory illness, again, to the individual. There would be average rates across the whole city. Ecological studies can also be used for health surveillance, where we can monitor changes in health outcomes and exposures in two or more geographical areas, and we can monitor population trends in one or more areas over time. Often, this is done to investigate unusual patterns in exposures and outcomes in space and time between geographical areas and uh, within one geographical area across time. In that sense, there are similarities with, with descriptive studies because descriptive studies can often use group level, population level information and statistics. So John Snow and the Broad Street Report is an example of an ecological study. So John Snow had an idea. He looked at water supply in terms of the Broad Street Pump, but he did not he did not go out and ask people whether they used the Broad Street Pump or not. He used a broad measure where he assumed to a large extent that the people living around the Broad Street Pump were likely to be drinking water from it. He did investigate some specific unusual instances in terms of, for example, the brewery where none of the brewers were, brewery workers were uh, drinking uh, the local water but were in fact drinking the beer and hence were not affected. But overall, his, uh, his hypothesis, he was not starting a study to actually examine this at a more controlled level. Another example uh, often with migrant studies where, for example, second generation Japanese migrants to the USA have substantially lower rates of stomach cancer than Japanese people in Japan. And this kind of start gives an indication of the cause of uh, the incidence of stomach cancer in Japan uh, and the fact that it is likely to be environmental in origin. And this can also be further examined by looking at first generation migrants to the US and the fact that compared to second generation migrants they had a slightly higher rate which suggests that the negative environmental influences leading to higher levels of stomach cancer may act early in life. Again the example comes from the BMJ uh, website and uh, the source is given there so you can go and have a look at that. What are the other examples of ecological studies? The classic example is air pollution and deaths from cardiovascular and respiratory disease and we have an example of that that we'll look at in a bit. Um, average salt intake and death from stroke is another good example. Average dietary fat intake and risk of colon cancer is also a good example and, and lastly the amount of green space in a neighborhood and the average health of residents in that neighborhood all four of these are examples of using group level or population level exposure data and linking that to average health data you know the risk across a country the risk across a, a city it is not risk at the individual level so this is the problem with ecological studies. The conclusions we make are really about the population, not the individual. They may work at the individual level and we may be lucky and we'll look at an example of air pollution, uh, which is a circumstance where air pollution impacts at the population level do translate to air pollution impacts at the individual level, but it's not always the case and we'll examine some examples where this does not work. And we can't apply population findings uh, to the individual level in ecological studies is because we only have average data. We have average exposure uh, measurements and we have average outcome data. And so population level information may be a distortion of what is happening at the individual level. And this is often because there are other factors, confounding factors, factors we don't know about at the population level that we have not taken into account uh, that has an impact on the health outcome. And an example of that would be, yes, air pollution does have an impact on respiratory and cardiovascular deaths, but it's also linked to smoking. So smoking and air pollution would 
mean that the person is at higher risk. So one of the things that ecological studies can't do is identify cities that also have high levels of smoking across the whole population. And so we would get distorted results where we would think air pollution was causing higher levels of deaths in certain cities if we did not take into account the levels of smoking that are happening in that city. And the other thing that may happen is that the other factors may affect the exposure, that somehow the exposure is being affected by another factor that is then changing that exposure. And again, simple example might be, for example, where we looked at cancers, that there may be something else in the diet. So if we found that high fat diets lead to colon uh, cancer, then there may be other things in the diet that may also increase the risk of colon cancer. And if you're only looking at fat, uh, that will give a distorted picture about what other dietary factors uh, or non-dietary factors may be affecting colon cancer risk. Now let's look at some examples of ecological bias or the ecological fallacy or the aggregate bias. A simple example is a sunlight exposure and skin cancer. So if we looked at data from the US, UK, Australia, Caucasian communities with white skins, we would say there's a very strong relationship between sunlight exposure and skin cancer. However, we couldn't apply that to the rest of the world because if we then looked at data across the Indian subcontinent and Africa, we would find that that association is much less strong and in fact, for in some circumstances, effectively zero because darker skin is protective for skin cancer. So again, if we used one set of data in high income countries and then tried to translate it into other countries, we would be making a mistake, we would be falling into a bias. So if we then took lots of countries, uh, the relationship would hide the fact that actually people with white skin are more likely to and more at risk of skin cancer and uh, people with darker skins are less likely to be at risk of uh, skin cancer and therefore that we need to target people with white skin by having all the countries mixed together we could get a result which shows that actually the risk of sunlight and skin cancer is quite low when actually it's a reflection of the fact that we have a lot of countries or we have a lot of data on people with darker skins and so the amount of melanin in the skin is a modifying or mediating factor between sunlight exposure and skin cancer and we would not be able to understand this at the group level without understanding the biology of human beings at the individual level. And here's my second example, and this is literacy rates and percentage of the population born outside the US at the population level. So a study was done looking at literacy rates and the percentage of people who are immigrants in uh, US states. And they found a positive correlation of 0.53, i.e. this meant that uh, where states had a high percentage of immigrants, that state also had a higher level of average literacy. Now, if we link that together and took that be, to be true, then we would think that the immigrants coming to that state also had higher levels of literacy, that we would assume that, yes, what is reflected at the state level also applies to individual immigrants in that state. However, when studies were done at the individual level looking at the literacy rate of immigrants in those states, the correlation was the opposite, it was negative, it was minus 0.11, i.e. the immigrants were on average less literate uh, than native citizens of these US states. And so why do we get this discrepancy? Why do we get such a difference in the relationship between literacy rate and uh, percentage of immigrants in US states? And the reason is because immigrants tended to settle in US states where the native population was more literate. So immigrants were actively choosing to go to states where the local population, the native population, had higher levels of literacy, i.e. they had higher education levels, they had more professional qualifications, they had more educational qualifications, and therefore, because their 
average levels in the native population of literacy was high, when the immigrants came in with their lower levels of literacy, the average level still stayed high. So it gave this false correlation that the immigrants also had higher literacy, when in fact they did not. And the reason why we may think, why did these immigrants uh, live in these US states? It may be because those states had better economies and more jobs. We generally know that uh, populations that are well-educated, have high levels of skills, are generally likely to also be more active and uh, both economically and in terms of uh, jobs. Now, this may not be true because immigrants also settle in places where there's already existing immigrant communities. Uh, but generally, most of the time, immigrants move to a country uh, because they want to improve their lives, often because of economic reasons. Sometimes it is for other reasons. Uh, but I think in this context, uh, the focus really is likely to be the economic aspects of these states where they settled. Again, uh, the reference for this paper is given in the slide and it's worth having a look at the paper uh, to look at this issue in more detail. So what are the strengths of ecological study designs? Well, they're cheap, cheap and quick because they use routine statistics. They're useful for generating hypotheses that we can then test at the individual level through cohort studies, randomized control trials, and maybe even case control studies. And differences in exposure between areas and over time are likely to be larger than those between individuals. So what this means is it's easier to study at the area level uh, cities and countries because the changes are likely to be bigger both in terms of exposures and in terms of outcomes. And therefore, we can see patterns much more clearly at the country or city level than we might do at the individual level. So it's worth starting with information and uh, data of exposures and outcomes at the country and city level, and then moving down and doing more detailed studies later once we identify a hypothesis or a potential cause and effect. Sometimes exposure information is only available at the area level because that's where routine statistics, health surveillance information is undertaken. You know, air pollution data is often averaged. It does not go down to the individual house. It does not go down to the individual street. It's often at district level. It's often at regional level and it's often at national level. And where the air pollution monitors, for example, are cited, they're often 5, 10, 15, 20 in a district of 250 thousand people in which case those air pollution monitors are not going to give accurate air pollution exposures for everyone it is going to only be able to give you average air pollution uh, levels lastly they're useful because you can map this geographical this ecological data using geographical information systems and potentially identify spatial patterns and spatial differences that help to identify potential causes of diseases and other health issues. However, the limitations of ecological study designs are the one we've already mentioned, which is population level causes may or may not be true causes at the individual level. That's really important. We can't assume that what we find at the population level will definitely apply at the individual level because there's systematic differences in recording outcomes and there's also systematic differences in measuring exposures. And both of these things create bias and we'll look at this in later Later sessions. Important thing though is uh, the lack of information about third factors, the confounding factors, the other population factors that may affect both exposures and outcomes. And uh, this is really important. Uh, for example, we looked at uh, the, uh, the example of uh, melanin and dark skins uh, in relationship to sunshine exposure and skin cancer, and that's what we mean by confounding factors. Uh, another example, which is in that video that I suggested you watch in uh, session two gave the example of ice creams and drownings uh, saying there's a correlation between the seasons when uh, children eat a lot of ice creams and when they're 
are lots of drownings of children. And of course, that is not a true relationship. The relationship is actually hot weather. When there's hot weather, children buy more ice creams and they also feel hot and then jump into rivers and lakes and ponds and hence put themselves at greater risk of drowning. So the relationship is actually hot weather and drowning rather than ice creams and drowning. Lastly, um, spatial boundaries can sometimes artificially divide populations or population groups in a way that obscures the true distribution of exposures and health outcomes. What do we mean by that? What we mean by that is we generally live and have data around political boundaries at ward level, at district level, at a city level. However, communities may not follow those political boundaries. Geographical communities often go across political boundaries and therefore if the data we have are only for political boundaries then we will miss out on true relationships uh, for geographical communities uh, because we're only collecting a part of the data that we need. So this is an example. This is a paper on air pollution and case face fatality rates of SARS in the People's Republic of China, an ecologic study. And so you can see here that there is a very strong relationship uh, uh, between air pollution and deaths from SARS. And what the researchers have done is that they have used average air pollution information for five cities, Guangdong, Shanxi, Hebei, Beijing and Tianjin and they have then mapped that with average levels of case fatalities in those five cities and what they found is that Guangdong had the lowest levels of air pollution and also had the lowest levels of SARS case fatalities and the opposite was found in Tianjin which had high levels of air pollution and high levels of SARS case fatality. So this gives an indication that air pollution may work cooperatively, synergistically with the SARS virus and make it worse for individuals who have SARS, making it more likely for them to be at risk of dying. Now, of course, we would need to do further studies because, as we've said before, average exposures do not tell us what's happening at the individual level. And therefore, the population finding that air pollution has some kind of effect on SARS, making it more likely that people die, may not apply at the individual level. We may find that at the individual level, air pollution does not have this effect. So we would need to do further studies at the individual level to find out if this is a true relationship, a true cause or related cause of death in people who have SARS. Now let's move on to cross-sectional studies. And it's important to note that cross-sectional studies can be both descriptive and analytic. And what that means is descriptive studies look generally at outcomes only and sometimes they will look at exposures only while analytic studies look at both exposures and outcomes. So we are collecting information at one point in time, both exposure information and outcome information. And that one point in time does not have to be one day. It's often a few months. It, it could be occasionally a year because obviously when you do a study, it takes time. And therefore, while we say it's a point in time, it's usually a period in time, but we collect data only once. And that's the important thing. From every individual, we're collecting information only once. And that information we collect is either exposure only or outcome only for descriptive studies or both exposure and outcome information for analytical studies. Now, cross-sectional studies are also called prevalence studies and some of the books and materials and articles that you may find will uh, describe cross-sectional studies as prevalence studies. <laughs> 
So what are the key characteristics of uh, cross-sectional studies? Where the, they're the simplest type of epidemiological study. Information is collected from each person or participant at one point in time. Information can be on health outcomes only, diseases, symptoms, for example, high blood pressure or indicators of health status like low birth weight or uh, height and weight and body mass index. Or information can be on exposures only, uh, for example, tobacco smoking, alcohol drinking, diet, occupation. Or information can be on both outcomes and exposures, for example, being HIV positive and being current injector of drugs. As I said before, there are two broad types of cross-sectional studies. Descriptive cross-sectional studies that look at, measure and collect either one of exposure or health outcome, but not both. And analytical cross-sectional studies that look at, measure and collect both exposure and health outcome data. And in analytical studies, what they are trying to do is to identify a relationship between the exposure or exposures and health outcome or health outcomes. So they are trying to do a study where they are trying to find out about cause and effect. Now there's a problem with that which we will come to later on. And these studies are like ecological studies in that they are good to do initially to identify potential relationships at the individual level. So you can imagine that uh, we initially do a descriptive study, then we move on to do an ecological study, and then we might move on to do an analytical cross-sectional study. And then finally, we either do uh, something like a case control study, a cohort study, or a randomized control trial, depending on the exposure and outcome we are looking at. What are the key aspects of cross-sectional studies? Well, it does not need a defined hypothesis. We can go out and collect data on anything that we think of. We don't need to say X causes Y or this exposure causes that outcome. We need to define and measure exposures and so that's important and we often use a questionnaire or maybe occasionally we might use physical measurements. Again, we need to define and measure outcomes. That's really important and that's important for all study types. And again, we may use a questionnaire or we may take physical measurements. Both of these things, exposure and outcome, when they are done in analytical studies uh, are done in the same period of time. So let's look at some examples of how this works and what kind of information and what kind of uh, measure of disease we look at. So we start with the population. We find recruit participants into our research and ideally they are a representative sample of this wider population. We then identify people, and in this example, we are looking at sugar in the diet, and we're only thinking about cross-sectional studies of an exposure. So we, we find the number of people with an exposure, like high to moderate level of sugar in the diet. And then we identify the people with no exposure, or no or low levels of sugar in the diet. And when we collect that information, we can calculate the prevalence of the exposure. The prevalence or the numbers of people or the percentage of people eating high to moderate levels of sugar in their diet. And we can also find the percentage and number of people eating a low or no sugar in their diets at one point or period in time. And we can do the same for a health outcome such as heart disease. So again, the same pattern. Can we choose participants in the research from the wider population? And we hope that it's going to be a representative sample. Again, that is sometimes a challenge in cross-sectional studies. And we find the number of people with the health outcome with high or moderate level of heart disease. And we find the number of participants with no or low levels of the health outcome, such as heart disease. And then again, we can calculate the prevalence 
of the health outcome, in this case the prevalence of heart disease. So it's the percentage and number of people with high to moderate level of heart disease at one point or period in time, or the percentage and number of people with low or no heart disease at one point or period in time. So now let's move on to analytical cross-sectional studies. They look at both exposures and outcomes, and again, we follow the same pattern. We choose our participants, or we recruit our participants, we invite our participants, and then we identify the number of people with the exposure and with the health outcome. The number of people with the exposure, but with no health outcome, and we can calculate the prevalence of the health outcome in the people who are exposed. Then we find out the number of participants with no exposure, but who still have the health outcome, and then find out the number of participants with no exposure and with no health outcome. And then again, we can calculate the prevalence of the health outcome in the participants, the people who were not exposed. Now let's look at an example of this and we will look at the same example that we looked at before, sugar in the diet and cardiovascular disease. So how would this look in terms of an analytical cross-sectional study? So again, we start with the wider population. We recruit, invite our participants into our research project. We then find out the number of people with high to moderate levels of sugar in their diet and with high and moderate levels of heart disease. And then we find the number of participants with high to moderate levels of sugar in their diet, but with low or no heart disease. And then we can calculate the prevalence of high to moderate heart disease in participants with high to moderate sugar in their diet. So you can see here the exposure is the sugar, the outcome is the heart disease, so the prevalence is, because the outcome is what we're interested in, the prevalence fit calculation, the prevalence measure that we are interested in is the number of people who have heart disease and have been exposed to high levels of sugar in their diet. Then we look at the number of participants with low or no sugar in their diet who still have high or moderate levels of heart disease. And then we look at the number of participants with low or no sugar in their diet and with no or low levels of heart disease. And again, we can calculate the prevalence of high to moderate heart disease in participants with low or no sugar in their diets. Now, because our hypothesis, and there is a hypothesis, there is an aim in this, we do have a cause and effect that we are interested in. And the cause we think is high sugar, high sugar diet, or a diet with high levels of sugar or moderate levels of sugar is likely or more likely to cause heart disease than diets that are low in sugar. So what we would expect is that the numbers of participants uh, at the top, in the top red box, with the four unicorns and the four hearts, the number of people in that group will be higher and larger than the number of people in the bottom red box where there's one unicorn and four red hearts as that would show that sugar in, is related to cardiovascular disease and increases the risks of cardiovascular disease. If we didn't find that, i.e. if the numbers were the same, then we would say that sugar is not linked or is likely not linked 
to heart disease. Now, because this is a cross-sectional study, we can't actually say that. Uh, we just have an indication, but this is not the type of study that we can do and show a cause and effect. We can just have some tentative idea, an initial guess that we then need to do further research on. And we'll come on to why that is in a moment. So the key measure of disease occurrence is prevalence and prevalence is the number of cases in a defined population at one point or period in time divided by the number of people, the total number of people in that defined population at one point or period in time. A case in this context is people who have the exposure or outcome we are interested in. A point prevalence is the frequency of a health outcome in a population at one point in time. And the example of that would be how many people in a neighborhood visited their local park on the 25th of December, 2019. So it'd be the number of people in a neighborhood who visited their local park on the 25th of December, 2019, out of all the people living in that neighborhood. A period prevalence is the frequency of a health outcome in a population during a set period of time. For example, using the same example uh, as for point prevalence, over the last year, how many times have people living in a neighborhood visited their local park? And that would be the number of people in a neighborhood who visited their local park in the last year, the last 12 months, out of all the people living in that neighborhood who could have visited that park. Now let's move on to an example of a descriptive cross-sectional study. So here is a study on suicidal thoughts and behaviours among Australian adults. And what I want to do is just briefly look at the objectives, uh, the method, and a little bit at the results uh, very quickly. So the objectives of this study was to provide an overview of the lifetime and 12-month prevalence of suicidal ideas, suicidal plans and suicide attempts. For Australian adults and particular population subgroups. And then to look at the health service needs of those people. The information came from a routine source, the 2007 National Survey of Mental Health and Wellbeing, which is a national representative household survey and the results were 13.3 percent of respondents had had suicidal ideas during their lifetime four percent had made a suicide plan and 3.2 percent had made a suicide attempt and in terms of the 12 month prevalence 2.3 percent had had suicidal ideas 0.6 percent had made a suicide plan and 0.4% had made a suicide attempt. So they do find some relationships. For example, suicidality in the previous 12 months tended to be more common in women, younger people, uh, those outside the labour force. So while this is largely a descriptive study, there are some elements of associations or relationships that they are also finding in this study. These are just relationships that they've identified uh, through doing that survey because they want to then look at how that may impact on health services. Now you can see this is about prevalence. We've just talked about it, that cross-sectional studies are good for doing prevalence studies about existing health issues or problems in a community and often they use existing sources of information or some kind of survey, questionnaire survey to get information because that is a quick and easy thing to do. Now let's look at an analytical cross-sectional study, health literacy and physical and psychological well-being in Japanese adults. And the objective of this study was to determine the prevalence of low health literacy and investigate the relationship between low health literacy and physical and psychological well-being in the Japanese general population. So this was a web-based survey of Japanese adults and they used one question, how confident are you filling out forms by yourself? as a measure of health literacy and they used a number of questions from a questionnaire 
and the World Health Organization Quality of Life Assessment to measure levels of well-being. And they found out of 1,040 adults that 15.5% had low health literacy and individuals with low health literacy reported lower physical well-being and lower psychological well-being compared to those with higher levels of health literacy. And this effect, even after adjusting for certain key confounding factors, such as socioeconomic background, health risk behaviours and existing chronic conditions, was still a significant relationship. So again, the references are given for both these papers. Please have a look at it if you want to explore in more detail what a cross-sectional study looks like, both a descriptive one and an analytical one. So what are the challenges of cross-sectional studies? Can we work out causes? You know, we can do an analytical cross-sectional studies, but is that a good thing in terms of identifying a relationship between exposures and outcomes? Thing is, we can't. The reason we can't is because we're measuring things at the same time. What we need to do to work out cause and effect is have exposures measured first, and then following people up over time and then seeing if the health outcome develops. By measuring things at the same time, we can't tell whether which came first. Was it the health outcome that led to the exposure or was it the exposure that led to the health outcome? And an example of that would be illness and unemployment. So often we can say that if people have an illness, they become unemployed. However, there could be the other relationship, which is that long-term unemployment leads to a lowering in mental health and well-being, and over time, potentially also a lowering of physical health and well-being. So unemployment can also lead to illness. And to see which one is more important, we would actually need to do a study where we, in the first one, we had people who had an illness and a job, and then followed these people over a one, two year period to see if they lost their job more often than people who did not have a health problem or long-term chronic condition. And for the other study, we would follow people who are unemployed and people who are employed and see whether those people who are unemployed tend to become ill more often than the people who are employed. So can we work out causation? The answer is no. However, there is a very rare case, generally genetic exposures, where we could use a cross-sectional study, and that is because the exposure does not change over time. For most of the things, the exposures are changing all the time, and therefore measuring exposures at one point in time is not useful to work out the cause and effect relationship between an exposure and a health outcome. One thing to note is, and this is often done for intervention studies where we can't do a randomised control trial or we don't have the money to do a randomised control trial. So where there's an intervention, we often use a repeat before and after cross-sectional study design approach where we do a cross-sectional study before the intervention, uh, maybe one during the intervention and one after the intervention and maybe one six months after the intervention finished and so on. And so we do repeated cross-sectional studies. And these are also done household and lifestyle surveys that are done on a yearly or two yearly basis, where these are repeated cross-sectional studies that give a snapshot over time uh, and that can potentially allow us to develop hypotheses about exposures and outcomes. And of course, they also help us to understand changes in the prevalence of a disease or health outcome and changes in potential exposures. The problem with some of these repeated cross-sectional studies is that the same people are not studied at each of those points. Generally, when we do these repeated cross-sectional studies, the population has changed and the people who will fill out our questionnaires have changed. Maybe not all of them, maybe 10%, maybe 5% may have changed. This is different from cohort studies where the same group of people are surveyed, studied or over a long period of time. So what are the strengths of cross-sectional study designs? They're simple or relatively simple. They're relatively quick. 
and cheap to do, and they're relatively easy to analyze, particularly descriptive cross-sectional studies. We can use existing sources of exposure and outcome data, and we can look at many exposures for a single outcome, and we can look at many health outcomes as well. Lastly, it may be the main or only way we could study some kinds of exposures or outcomes. The biggest limitation, as I've said earlier, is we cannot identify causal relationships. We do not know whether the exposure occurred before or after the outcome, as both are measured at the same point in time. Hence, they can lead to an over-interpretation of findings. Hence, when you see an analytical cross-sectional study, you have to assume that the relationship is very weak, uh, because any relationship we find through a cross-sectional study will not be good evidence for a true relationship between an exposure and outcome. Compared to other study designs, they're more likely to have selection bias and information bias. Now, all study designs suffer from selection bias and information bias. There are many types of biases, but most of them fall into these two categories. In terms of selection bias, Two key issues are response and non-response of participants. How many participants uh, responded or didn't respond uh, to uh, the survey? And what kind of participants responded or didn't respond? So, for example, you may have invited a thousand people, but only 500 uh, decided to respond. In that case, we don't know how the findings would have changed if the other 500 people had also taken part. Similarly, we may find that more women drop out or more men drop out or more ethnic minorities drop out or more poorer people drop out. In which case, what is the implication of that? Those people had stayed on. How would that have changed our findings? The other aspect of selection bias is how representative uh, the participants are, the study sample participants are to the population they come from. And that often again relates to the size of the sample of people, participants that we have. Is it big enough to have a diverse group of people that reflect the age profile, the sex ratio, the ethnicity, the socioeconomic background of the community that they come from? In terms of information bias, the key issues are validity and reliability. And this, at its core, is about how good the instruments used to collect the data on exposure and health outcomes are. These can include questionnaires, interviews, diaries, equipment, and also researchers, because often researchers are the ones who administer the questionnaire or take uh, measurements of blood or blood pressure or other types of physical uh, measurements that the survey requires or who are undertaking the interview with the participants. And an example of validity is, does the questionnaire question that we are using measure what we want it to measure? Is there a different meaning to the words we have used in the question that could be misinterpreted? So one of the issues with questionnaires is that we can't normally just translate the questionnaire from English to Swahili just using Google Translate because words like health, well-being, obesity may not be understood in that other language. And so what we need is someone proficient and who is a health expert in that language to go and translate the questionnaire for us and then for us to test that questionnaire out with a group of people who speak Swahili and talk to them about why they answered the question in the way they did and what they understood to be the meaning of that question so that we can make sure that the question and the questionnaire is asking the right things and we are getting the information that we are really looking for. An example of reliability, which in the literature is also called repeatability, is will the questionnaire or the question produce the same results, same findings in the same situations for the same people, even if it's given at different points in time? So if we 
uh, talked to one person today or gave them a questionnaire and they answered it today and if six months from now we went back to that person and they were in the same situation they were six months ago would they answer that question and that questionnaire in a similar way and if they didn't then that would mean that our instrument or measurement device is not reliable. Often you will see with physical equipment that uh, the journal articles, the papers that you will read will talk about how they calibrated uh, the physical equipment and how they tested it for reliability and also with researchers how they train the researchers to carry out the questionnaire or the interview in a certain way so that there was a consistency across different researchers who were taking part and doing uh, the work of collecting data from participants. This is the end. I hope you enjoyed it. We will look at a practical exercise on descriptive ecological and cross-sectional studies in the apply session. I hope you enjoyed this session and I hope you found it interesting. I look forward to seeing you next time.